This is my favorite song in binary code. This way too long series of zeros and ones theoretically contains all the ingredients that for me constitute the perfect song. All the rhythms, all the melodies, and all the dynamics. For all I know, this could be your favorite song too. So I want you to ask yourself, can this binary code contain all the necessary information to create your favorite song? Many people seem to think so. In fact, you can find plenty of TED Talks by computer scientists showing off new artificial intelligence that can generate a song from a computer. This computer, they say, can generate music just as well, if not better, than masterminds such as Bach and Beethoven themselves. And their algorithms are getting better at it by the day. But many people would also disagree. I asked hundreds of people for this talk the very simple question, what makes a song great? And here are some of the answers I got. We find words like emotion, connection, atmosphere, performance, surprise, and nostalgia. So maybe there's more to writing a good song than just getting the numbers right. And this debate really fascinated me too because I'm certainly not a professional musician. I love to sing barbershop music, a genre of acapella music traditionally sung by old white men with straw canes and hats that I desperately try and convince people is cool. But when you get to a really high level of barbershop, you realize just how much of the way that we experience music is grounded in mathematics. And there are some real nerds who can geek out about it for hours. I, I was at this uh, barbershop singing convention. Yeah, you didn't already think I was a dork, you, you do now. And we were singing deep into the night, everyone was pretty drunk. And this guy came up to me and said that I should sing the frequency of the scale degree lower by roughly 8% at 40 decibels to allow the ratio of the wavelengths of the sound waves of the diminished seventh chord to align in the notes of the harmonic series to resonate. And I just looked at him like, are you kidding me? It's like 4 a.m. But what I did realize is that the chords of barbershop harmony are practically scientifically engineered to sound good. Certain combinations of frequencies create overtones that amplify harmonics, make chords ring, and target our emotional heartstrings. Trust me, the first time I saw all this math, like, I was just as confused as you are. But clearly, there's something highly mathematical about why I love to sing barbershop. So I really began to wonder, maybe music as math and, and music as emotion aren't as contradictory as they sound, but merely two sides of the same coin. Maybe music is just a means of storing our, uh, our emotion in physical, mathematical form, allowing us to share it and reproduce it. After all, musical elements such as sound and silence, harmony, and unison, tempo and rhythm, these are all highly mathematical, physical, quantifiable concepts. Great composers can use these musical elements to capture the human experience. But if the key to unlocking the potential of music is math, then wouldn't the greatest composer of all be a computer? This opens the door wide for computers and even artificial intelligence to be massively influential in the music of the future. Artificial intelligence, AI, sees emotion as the product of music, kind of like a mathematical function. The inputs are mathematical patterns of sound waves, and the outputs are electrochemical patterns of neural storms, our emotions. The better a computer can measure these biological indicators of emotion, such as heart rate, blood pressure, and hormone levels in our body, the better it will find patterns and be able to predict which sequence of notes elicits which emotions 
efficiently? Did your heartbeat increase when the beat dropped? Did your body release dopamine when the key changed? If music is really about creating emotion and, and, and which sequence of notes creates which emotions, then few, if any humans, will be able to compete with such a technology. And attempts to create such technology have already begun. Think of uh, Spotify, which uses algorithms to predict which music we will enjoy based on our output, such as likes and, and listening time. In a few decades, this could go one step further. If your partner just broke up with you, Alexa could put on the perfect song to make you feel better. Generate melodies that perfectly fit your unique emotional state and individual quirks. Generate music that is mathematically perfect for your human experience. So we see that in the realm of AI, music is kind of like a tool to manage our emotions. And this has massive health and psychological implications. Having music that can help us study and focus, help us sleep, help us meditate, help us with therapy. But if we are only listening to music that controls our emotions, who decides which music we listen to? Can music be used to make us feel a certain way, think a certain way, or even vote for a certain politician without us ever realizing it? But I'm not here to tell you about how awesome AI is going to be. And I also don't want to make you think that robots are going to take over the world and control our emotional state. What I want you to take away from this talk is that music is more than a tool to manage our emotions. Sure, music influences our emotions, but our emotions also create our music. As I said, AI sees music as nothing more than a series of mathematical equations. And emotion has nothing more than the product of those equations. But the reality of music is far more complex. Music goes the other way, too. It isn't just a one-way street. It's a two-way street. Music is also the product of emotion. Allow me to make this clear. Leonard Bernstein once said that music functions like a metaphor. Writing music is like saying, Juliet is the sun. When Shakespeare wrote those words, he did not literally want his audience to think that Juliet is a burning ball of gas 149.3 million kilometers away from Earth. Romeo was comparing Juliet to his experience of the sun the way it feels on our skin, and, and the sense of wonder we get when it sets over the horizon. If you have never seen the sun before, this metaphor is meaningless. And music is similar. Many say that the minor chord is a metaphor for sadness. But if you have never felt sad before, it won't mean much because the minor chord does not create sadness out of nothing within us. It merely evokes the sadness that we already carry with us. The emotions and experiences that we have change the way that we perceive music. Music is a two-way street. And this really got me wondering, if, if music functions like a metaphor, then what is it a metaphor of? For me, music is a metaphor for the nuances of our social lives. The, the melody, rhythm, and, and unique tone of each song that we hear mirrors the, the unique character, flow, and sense of expectation in, in every conversation that we have. When we listen to music, whether we know it or not, we are searching to hear our society our interactions and ourselves echoed in the sounds around us. Let me make this even clearer. I'm from Berlin, and uh, 
One of my favorite places to go in the entire city is this little place on Hauptstrasse called the Zigzag Jazz Club. When you walk in, it's like, a, it's like a cozy living room. There's sofas all over the place, and you might get yourself a cool drink. And then, as the bowl of sound hits you, it almost knocking you out of your socks, as, as, as it vibrates in your bones, the blasts from the trumpets and the enchanting guitar melodies compelling you out of your seat, compelling you to dance and sing along. It's nothing short of magic. And the performances are always live, so the performers interact with the audience, telling their story and sharing their emotion. The audience is also a third party to the interactions happening between the performers. And, and the uh, audience even interacts with itself. The jazz club attracts people from all corners of Berlin, making it a microcosm for the, for the rich, hip, multicultural experience of being a Berliner. And everything happening inside that jazz club also interacts with everything happening outside it. What I had for breakfast that morning and, and, the, and the news headline. And it's funny because I don't listen to jazz all that much in my free time. By itself, that mathematical sequence of notes, rhythms, and harmonies, it doesn't produce emotion within me. What makes the experience at the jazz club unique and special is that I'm listening to that sequence of notes, rhythms, and harmonies in that place, on that day, at that time, with those people. Music, as it exists two-dimensionally in binary code, is meaningless until you have listened to it and allowed it to pass through the prism of your own personal experiences. This is also why artists say that their work is never finished. Is it because they are bad at math and, and cannot calculate the right sequence of notes to capture their emotions? No. It's because the way a song makes us feel and, and, and the context in which it is being performed is constantly changing and evolving. There's a famous proverb that says, no man ever steps into the same river twice. For it is not the same river, and it's not the same man. Similarly, we never listen to the same music twice. It changes as we change. So I don't want to say that AI in the music industry is impossible or only bad. But I can't help but think that the way it approaches music is too simple. It may only go in one direction of the two-way street. The goal for, for AI and music is to create perfection, testing countless of possibilities to find the one sequence of notes that will solve the mathematical problem of maximizing emotion. But great music is imperfect. It has mistakes. With our individual quirks and unique emotional states, we bring as much to the table as music elicits from us. And that is precisely what allows it to be such a good metaphor for the imperfections of our daily lives. So does that mean that there are no physical laws that allow music to be used as a tool? Not at all. Merely that if we allow AI to make us forget about that second direction of the two-way street, and we really only focus on trying to create meaning prior to our experience of listening, then we risk losing sight of what truly makes music great. And if AI one day becomes so developed that it can prove everything that I just said completely wrong, that AI is a one-way street, that will fundamentally change the way we define music, and, and thereby the way we as humans exist, function, and interact within society. So you're all probably now dying to know what is my favorite song. So to conclude, let me make the grand reveal. That was the binary code of Under Pressure 
by Queen. And what makes it my favorite song? Well, when I was about seven years old, my family and I were, we were at a local Chinese restaurant. And in comes Brian May, the guitarist of Queen, in a bathrobe to order his takeout chicken chow mein. And my mom desperately went through her bag, trying to find a pen and paper. And out came this like pink, fluffy princess pen with feathers that lights up when you write with it. And you know, I took it, and I went up to Brian May, and got his signature nonetheless. We went home that night, and, and my dad put on the Queen's Live Aid concert from, from 1985. And I could see the excitement in his eyes as he was telling me of all the memories he had of that event. Brian May became an idol of mine, inspiring me to learn guitar and, and pursue music. Under Pressure became one of the first songs I ever arranged a cappella. And, and every time I hear it, I have to think of the countless times I sang it at karaoke night with my mom. So I want you to think about the story behind your favorite song. You cannot tell me that all of that emotion and experience can ever be reduced to binary code. Or at least I sure as hell hope not.